Hello, and welcome to the SIX Festival. The festival is part of SIX, the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science. I'm Matt Salganik, one of the organizers of SIX. The mission of the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science is to provide open, high quality training in computational social science to researchers around the world. We want to accelerate the growth of the field and ensure that it develops practices that are in the long-term interest of science and society. Each summer since 2017, we've offered two-week summer training programs for graduate students, postdocs, and junior faculty. The summer institutes are for both social scientists and data scientists broadly conceived. So far, we have provided this free training to more than 700 participants around the world. The event that you are now attending is part of the SIX Festival, which provides a chance for our alumni to host tutorials and participate in discussions of interest to the computational social science community. This event is a tutorial about deep learning for causal inference led by Bernard Koch. Bernie is a graduate student in sociology at UCLA. His research interests include the science of science and culture, and he has methodological interests in machine learning, causal inference, and Bayesian modeling. And the subject of this tutorial obviously is closely related to his methodological interests. Uh, as you heard at the beginning, this event is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube for others to learn from. So with that background, it's my pleasure to now turn it over to Bernie. Great, uh, thanks Matt. And uh, I'm really excited you all are here. I, I love doing six, I love teaching and I'm excited to share this stuff with you. So uh, yeah, I'm Bernie. I'm a fifth year grad student uh, in the sociology department at UCLA. As you can see, I'm, I'm sitting in the UCLA quad right now. Um, I was wondering if I could get a quick kind of poll from you guys about how comfortable you are with causal inference and how comfortable you are with machine learning. Uh, so if, if you're comfortable with causal inference, put a thumbs up. If you have kind of gotten a brief intro to causal inference before, maybe put a thumb sideways according to, to Matt, this is something you can do. And if not, you can leave it blank or, or thumbs down. I think that would just be, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, we can only do the thumbs sideways if people turn on their camera. So if you wanna Got just it. do a thumbs up or not. Okay. So, yeah, okay, so I'm thinking like, to me, it looks like a fair amount of people, but not uh, not everybody. And then what about supervised machine learning? Okay. I think uh, somebody asked me, what do I mean? I mean, machine learning, just kind of how supervised machine learning works. Yeah, so I don't really expect you to know anything about neural networks. Hopefully I'll teach you a bit today. Um, but okay, so that's pretty good. I feel like I saw at least 50 to 60% bank on both of those things. So somewhere in there. So uh, that's helpful. I'm gonna get started, but uh, you know, I scheduled an hour and a half for this so that hopefully we'd have a bit more time for you to interrupt me and ask questions. Uh, Megan's going to help me out with that. Uh, but yeah, please do stop me because I feel like uh, I'm trying to cover, we're trying to cover a lot of ground in a pretty short time. And so, uh, yeah, if, if something doesn't make sense or I'm rushing or whatever, feel free to intervene. I do think that's always helpful for everybody. Okay, so I am going to share my slides and get started. Okay, uh, can you guys see things? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Megan. Okay, yeah, so, right, so this is gonna be a tutorial about deep learning and causal inference. Uh, this is something that I've become interested in. I think uh, there's a lot of interest in the social science community and using machine learning for causal estimators. And there's actually interest in the machine learning and AI community and doing the same thing. And I feel like there's actually not that much crosstalk. Uh, so kind of the goal here is, is to kind of introduce you to this stuff and show you why I think it's pretty interesting and cool. Uh, I'm not necessarily evangelizing that you go out there and use this uh, because I think this, this literature is still kind of currently in development and we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of, of where this stuff 
goes. But I do think, uh, you know, I'm excited to, to show it to you and I'm excited to show you uh, in TensorFlow how to implement some of these models. And if you've never done any deep learning modeling before, uh, this is a great opportunity to learn those things too. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Oh, so this is uh, this whole thing was motivated by a review that uh, I'm working on with my, my co-authors here. So Tim, Tim is a grad student, probably graduating or if not graduated uh, at UCSD. Uh, Pablo is uh, in my department. Uh, Song and Yijo are UCLA computer scientists, and Jacob's my advisor. Yeah. So why use deep learning for causal inference, right? So in practice, neural networks are really low bias estimators, uh, and they can learn extremely complex functions. Like theoretically, uh, a neural network with an infinite hidden layer can can approximate any continuous function, and so because of that. Uh, they're really ideal for estimating heterogeneous treatment effects or conditional average treatment effects. Uh, and that's kind of the main motivation for how this literature got started and more generally why people became interested in machine learning for, for causal estimation. So other reasons these models would be cool is that there are creative architectures that might help with overlap issues. So overlap is uh, you know when you have treated and control distributions without that many uh, units that are similar. Uh, uh, and then the, the other thing that I think is kind of a really novel way of, of doing adjustment for confounding, which is unique to this literature really, is called uh, representation learning, which is kind of a fundamental concept in, in deep learning that I'll, I'll talk about extensively in this tutorial. Um, so representation learning has been used, uh, one of the things that makes it cool compared to other approaches to machine learning is that deep learning models can automatically extract features or covariates from, from the data that are salient without you having to tell it, this thing is important, let me modify it, this thing is important, let me modify it, et cetera. And so that's led to uh, deep learning models that can learn a lot automatically when you feed them graphs or images or text. Uh, and so that's very exciting if you have latent confounders that you think could be encoded uh, in these types of complex data. Uh, obviously, there are other things you can do if you think these things are instruments or, or mediators. I'm not really going to talk about that possibility, even though there's, you know, a lot of work on those types of things, too. But the simplest thing to think about is maybe there's confounding encoded in, in these complex data types. So, and lastly, uh, you know, you're probably a social scientist, maybe not, but social scientists are often interested in inference. Uh, a motivation for a lot of this work is actually uh, uh, prediction and being able to predict treatment effects in populations where you don't have uh, treatment information. And I actually think that that could be an exciting use for the stuff that's that's uh, underexploited by, um, yeah, underexploited by uh, uh, social scientists. Okay, and then just to kind of set up the motivation here. Uh, here's a couple simulations to show uh, some simulation simulation results to show that if you do care about estimating heterogeneous treatment effects or you know treatment effects for individuals or groups of individuals with the same covariates, uh, these models do perform. They're really good at this. You know, uh, I think the theoretical guarantees in some cases are lagging behind or framed in terms of prediction instead of uh, asymptotic inference guarantees that social scientists and, and statisticians, social statisticians like, but they're really good at uh, having low bias estimation. So the last four models here are machine le are deep learning models. Uh, and you can see the, the, the P he score is something I'll talk about later, but that's like error in conditional average treatment effects. And then there's error in, in the average treatment effect. And you can see you go down from the linear models to uh, general machine learning models to machine learning models that have been optimized for causal inference, and then to the four deep learning models, and, and the four deep learning models uh, are particularly good for kind of estimating heterogeneous conditional conditional average treatment, treatment effects, excuse me. Um, okay, so the outline of the talk is I'm going to do a brief causal inference introduction. I'm going to talk about, sorry, brief intro to machine learning and representation learning, deep learning and representation learning. I'm gonna show you some models. There'll be conclusions to the talk form of this. And then we'll talk about some practical considerations for training neural networks. And then we'll go into the tutorial. So causal inference under selection non-observables. Um, 
So uh, if, you, if you are or are not familiar with causal inference, I think it's always really important to make this distinction between causal identification, right, and causal estimation, right? Causal identification is actually the hard part of causal inference. And that's saying like, I have some data, uh, I have some assumptions, like with the data and the assumptions I have, is it reasonable to say that I could isolate a causal effect, right? And that's really what, you know, causal inference is about. Like, can I actually, you know, theoretically, can I actually estimate a causal effect? And then when you say yes to that question, and here's how I do it, then it's just a land of statistical estimation. You know, it's a land of algorithms where <clears throat> the question is just like, how can I get the best estimates for that causal effect? So we are definitely in this tutorial on the right side of, the, of this chart. Uh, but I, I'll emphasize that actually the important part of causal inference, when we talk about causal inference, we're really, the important part is the left side of this chart. And so I'm going to tell you about what the assumptions that and, and scenario that uh, these models are designed for. Excuse me. So uh, um, these models are designed for an identification strategy called selection on observables in the potential outcomes framework. So there's two or three uh, causal frameworks that are used across science. Uh, potential outcomes is the one that's popular in social science and medicine. Uh, and in potential outcomes, you have the idea is that each unit has two potential outcomes, right? They could have an outcome if they were treated, uh, and they could have a potential outcome if they were not treated, and you only get to observe one of those. In potential outcomes, they talk about that as the fundamental problem of causal inference. Um, but there's another uh, framework that's, that's also very popular called the structural causal model, uh, and that's popular in epidemiology and computer science. Uh, and, and the structural causal model, one of the nice things about it is that you can represent uh, causal relationships using directed acyclic, acyclic graphs. Um, and so uh, I think it, it makes it, you know, these two frameworks have significant amount of disagreement about things, but one thing that they have really great overlap on is understanding uh, this selection on observables identification strategy, or as it's called in the structural causal model, the backdoor criteria. So whenever someone says, oh, I'm doing selection on zero rules or, or the backdoor criterion, they just show this, this template DAG here. And the idea is here is that you have some covariates uh, that are common causes of both the treatment and the outcome, right? This is classic confounding, right? So uh, the, the arrows, the direction of the arrows depict causal relationships. Uh, and for uh, confounding to occur, right? There has to be a path that is not fully causal that is uh, that that is not blocked or not conditioned on. So the causal path we're interested in is t to y, but there's also a path, non-causal path, from t to x to y, right? And that's confounding. That that will introduce confounding bias that we want to block. So I feel like it's not that helpful to to just show you a template DAG. I want to show you a real kind of example here. So. Uh, we're going to use a naturalistic simulation based on a real experiment uh, in, in the tutorial uh, from the 90s called the Infant Health and Development Program. It's introduced in a paper that you can see is cited in the tutorial, uh, the, 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 the simulation is rather. Uh, but here's the scenario. Let's say that uh, we have a bunch of premature babies uh, and we give an intervention where we provide them, uh, the mothers, uh, significant child care and prenatal care and a lot of support. And then we're interested in what are the cognitive and developmental benchmarks of the babies sometime later. I can't remember if it's three, six, three, six, three months, six months, 18 months, I'm not sure. So that would be an experiment, but what if this is an observational study and you have to sign up for the intervention, right? So now in this observational study, there's clear confounding, right? We could say that, uh, you know, parents who are uh, affluent and educated are, you know, more likely to search for these types of programs and seek them out and go through the bureaucracy to, to sign up or whatever. And so uh, you could say that SES is, could be causal of treatment. Uh, there's also probably a relationship between socioeconomic status and benchmarks in that people who have uh, more time 
and more resources are more likely to do breastfeeding, right? And we know that breastfeeding is associated with, uh, you know, uh, infant development. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the question then is, these are confounding paths, how do we block them? So we're going to get to that later. So um, in, in the potential outcomes framework, this is kind of the scenario we're trying to solve, like how do we, how do we block that backdoor path? Uh, these are the assumptions that are required. So in order to do that, we have to have no hidden confounders. This is called strong conditional ignorability. And the X that is in our data is, are all of the X's that could actually uh, confound our, our, our relationship. That is like there are no there are no unseen things that we haven't measured that could induce bias in this way, and an extension of that from structural causal models that we shouldn't have instruments or, or collider variables, but you don't need to worry about that as well. Um, overlap. So we want to make sure that all treatments have a non-zero probability of being observed. Right. Uh, there's no way that nobody somebody could not get a treatment, and this doesn't mean that the distributions empirically have to have perfect common support, they will not, uh, but, but it means that in theory, they have to have been able to. And then sutva or consistency, which I think is stable unit treatment value. Uh, I, I can't remember, but so the consistency uh, assumption is basically that the treatment and outcomes of different subjects are independent, right? So there's no spillover uh, between treatments and uh, if you receive a treatment at a dosage, you will have an effect, right? That, that's something that's consistent. Um, okay, so, and then really quickly, you know, like this is now not, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is just kind of an estimation representation of what we're doing. But like, let's say we want to, this, we want to have, we have some covariates X that could be confounding. We have an outcome Y, right? And really what we're trying to do here is get a counterfactual for the blue dot here or the red dot by comparing it to somebody who is really similar on those covariates, right? Um, and uh, there's a lot of people here who don't have perfect comparisons like these people, right? So what we're gonna do is actually estimate some functions. Uh, these are the red lines and, and the blue lines. Uh, and this is gonna allow us to calculate conditional average treatment effects uh, at, at, at any kind of point along X, right? That's that's really what we're doing in, in, with these methods, right? Is we're gonna create a fancy, it could be a linear model or it could be a neural network, it could be anything uh, to learn the red line and to learn the blue line. Uh, and then we're gonna plug these estimates in and then we're gonna calculate conditional average treatment effects. So that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, here's some simple notation. You just don't worry about this. The treatment is uh, T, potential outcomes are Y1 and Y0. And these are kind of the quantities that we're interested in, right? The, the expected difference between Y1 and Y0 and the conditional you know, difference. OK, so now I'm going to talk about deep learning. Um, I wish I had, uh, Megan, can you just chat me what time it is? I wish I had grabbed my phone. Um, but uh, OK, great, 1120. OK. Um, so yeah, so background on neural networks. So uh, these are machine learning models that uh, uh, are inspired by the human brain. Uh, so uh, they're graphical models, but they're and they're generally directed graphical models, but they are not the the causal models that I showed you uh, before. Those are causal graphs, right? These are these are computational graphs. And so in these graphs, you can look at the one on the top right. Uh, the nodes are represented as circles. And the edges are weights, they're parameters in the network, right? And uh, the nodes, each node, other than the input nodes, uh, takes all of its inputs and sums them and does a nonlinear transformation, it takes all of its weighted inputs. So uh, each input will be, you know, uh, each input will be multiplied by its weight uh, before the nodes which take it aggregate those weights by summing them and then do this nonlinear transformation. So when you have no hidden layers, this is called a perceptron. Uh, this was originally conceived of in like 1957, and it's exactly equivalent to logistic regression if you're a social scientist and just trying to understand what's going on here. Uh, but what makes deep learning powerful or, or, or neural networks, artificial neural networks powerful is the introduction of these hidden layers where you can have kind of concatenated layers 
uh, in the network. Uh, and that's what makes them able to uh, approximate really complex functions. Uh, and so uh, compared to other areas of machine learning, like probably in six, you learn about other types of machine learning, uh, neural networks uh, were not very good. And they kind of fell out of favor in, in the late 80s uh, until I'd say the early 2000s, uh, when there started to be kind of technical advances in how to train them. They're very computationally expensive to train. Uh, we start to get more data and uh, we figured out how to train these networks on graphics cards. And so these, this, these kind of convergence of things uh, led to discoveries that uh, if you have a lot of data and you can train them a lot and you can train them efficiently, uh, a neural network with more hidden layers can do way better uh, than, than, than pretty much any other machine learning approach. And so they've become very hegemonic uh, across science and industry uh, in terms of approaches to deep, uh, to machine learning compared to say uh, decision tree based approaches or SVMs. Okay, but again, to kind of hammer this point home, like really what this is, is like the perceptron here, this is a graphical representation of a linear model, right? You, you have all the X's, you multiply them by weights and you sum them and you do the sigmoid or logistic transformation and you get a probability of y say right but actually uh you know another way to look at what's going on here is there's a geometric interpretation of what's going on here and that's what i want you to to kind of see so that you know we can understand what representation learning is right uh in the geometric interpretation you're taking a three-dimensional vector consisting of x1 x2 x3 and you're transform transforming it into a one-dimensional space uh, by multiplying it by these weights, beta one, beta two, beta three, uh, and and it's a, and creating a scalar, right? And uh, you had some loss function that optimized something that you want these weights to learn, and so you created what's called a representation of this data, x one, x two, x three. That's actually useful for you, right? It's a represent representation that captures the probability of y. Um, okay, that that might seem a little silly to think about uh, logistic regression that way, but I think it'll make sense when we look at more complicated networks, right? So here's here's a, a multi-layer perceptron or a feed-forward network or a deep neural network, and now we have a vector of inputs, and this could be your covariate data x, you know, all the things you know, including SES that affect both uh, signing up for treatment and the outcome, and uh, whatever. And uh, we are now going to do this kind of projection. And here we've projected it into a, a four dimensional space, right? And when we go through another layer of the network, we end up with a two dimensional space, right? Um, and so we can do this with other types of input too, right? If we somehow figure out to encode words into a, a vector, we can transform those into a vector space using a neural network and create a representation. Uh, or we could do it with pixels in an image, or we could even do it with graphs or, or social networks or other types of networks. Okay, so um, this is called representation learning. And uh, sorry, I have my face in the way. So, oh, yeah, so the red arrow is like, okay, so that's cool that you can make representations, but how do you make representations that are actually useful? How do you make representations that are capturing uh, information in the input vectors? that are actually you know, more meaningful than what you have, that have only extracted the relevant information. And so for that, you need a loss function to test the, the, network, the, the, the neural network to learn something. So here's kind of a classic example of, of representation learning where they gave a network, you give a network a very simple task and it learns really interesting representations. So let's say you want a network to learn how to detect faces and give it this deep neural network. Uh, we don't have to talk about convolution or whatever, but just maybe you can see that like in this example, uh, you have early layers and they create representations that of really low level stuff like edges in the face uh, and intermediate layers detect facial features. The representations look like facial features. Uh, and then the, and towards the end of the network, you have kind of complete representations of the face. Uh, and this is all just by answering the question, is there a face in this network? Is there a face in this picture? Yes or no? Give me the probability of that. Uh, another kind of example you might be more familiar with as a social scientist uh, is uh, um, 
is our word vectors, right? So uh, in, in, in word vectors, word to vec, like models like word to vec or glove, uh, you take words and you use a simple uh, deep neural network with one hidden layer uh, and you project it into a vector space uh, and then you just give it the task of something like predict the next word, right? That's all it's saying is like, here's, you know, here's five words or whatever, predict the next word. Uh, and it learns these representations where words that are semantically similar to each other are closer together uh, in representation space. So the motivation for why I'm telling you all this is now we have the question like, can we learn representations for causal inference? That's, that's what we're trying to do here that are useful for causal inference. And how do we do that? And uh, what this looks like is, let's say we have a representation function phi, that the neural network layers encode some function phi. And what we want to do is take the covariates uh, in, in the original space and transform them into a vector space such that their representation is adjusted so that uh, it is difficult to distinguish between the covariates for the treated and control groups. OK, I think I want to stop here and uh, ask, get, figure out some, see if there are any questions. Anybody? OK, in that case, I'll, I'll keep going. But really, please, please do feel free to ask questions in the chat. Like, I love that. And obviously, it's probably helpful for, for other people. OK. So let's let's move forward. Okay, so now now kind of I hope I've have an, enough background on each of these things to understand what we're trying to do here. Uh, now I'm going to talk to you about models for deep learning uh, to do causal inference, particularly for the selection of observables uh, identification strategy. So um, there are different estimation strategies to serve the selection to 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 solve the the selection on observables problem, right? So here's the original DAG I showed you. Uh, one way you can deal with this is treatment modeling, right? And so you create this, here's an example where you create this, this variable called the propensity score and you condition on it. And now you've blocked the backdoor paths between T uh, and X and two and three because they have to go through this square block and they can't, right? And so now there's no longer confounding bias and you just have the treatment effect on Y. What we're doing here is a different approach, uh, which is outcome modeling, right? We're taking all the covariates and we're feeding this, them to this rep representation function uh, f, and it creates this representation, uh, this new variable, which has blocked the paths between x and y. So now you have a, you know, a backdoor path from t to x, but it doesn't get to y. Uh, so that also solves our problem. And something that people often do is what are called doubly robust estimators where they create, uh, they do both treatments and outcome modeling. And this protects them from situations uh, where one of the models is poorly specified, right? And so even if one of the models is poorly specified, hopefully the other one is good uh, and you get some guarantees from doing that, uh, that hopefully you're still gonna be able to correctly adjust for confounding bias. Um, and so these are very popular across different types of estimators, including linear models but also here in this deep learning literature. Okay, so here's an outcome modeling example, and this is a uh, neural network that you are going to implement today, or at least that is the goal. Um, so this is kind of the seminal paper in this literature, if you're interested in looking it up. It's by uh, Uri Shalit uh, and Frederick Johansson and their collaborators. They published a series of these papers. Uh, but this is kind of the first one, which is like, maybe we can use representation learning for causal inference. So the model is actually really quite straightforward. Uh, it looks just like the multi-layer perceptrons that I showed you before, except that there's one catch. Instead of having one uh, head after the representation layers, uh, you now have two heads to the network. And each one is trying to predict a potential outcome, right? So one of them, uh, is only going to get gradients for Y0 examples. And it's going to be like, can I do a really good job at predicting outcomes for the untreated examples? And the other one is going to do the same thing, but for the treated examples. And the intuition here is that these things are both feeding gradients back to the representation layers, the representation function. And now it has two 
two problems to solve. This is called multitask learning in, in machine learning or deep learning. And it has to be equally good at both of them. And the idea is that if it is gonna be equally good at both of them, it has to have a shared representation of both treated and control covariate distributions. So yeah, just to be clear, the only thing that's getting fed here is X, right? The treatment information is implicit in which had you're, you're predicting from. And you just train this network like a regular uh, machine learning model, machine learning regressor, or you know, you you tell it to minimize the mean squared error, and after you're done training, uh, you plug in X and it poops out two different predictions: the Y zero potential outcome and the Y one potential outcome, and you plug those into computer treatment effects, and then you can average over those if you're interested in not the Kate but the ATE. Okay. Um, so, but the kind of idea here was kind of indirect, right? I said, like, we give it these two tasks and we hope that it will, you know, develop a good shared representation of both types of data, both data sets. But we could tell the neural network to do that more explicitly. Uh, and one way to do that is to add an additional loss to the network saying, okay, network, not only do you have to be able to predict the potential outcomes well, but you have to do something to force these two, smush these two distributions closer in representation space. Um, and so we'll talk about that. And then we can also talk about how this could be uh, combined with treatment modeling after you've done you know, the representation of the data. Okay, so here's a kind of more explicit balancing example. So to go back here, let's say that the the question mark here we want to have instead of being a prediction of a propensity score, we want it to be an extra loss function. Okay, so one way we could do this is we can use integral probability metrics, and this is what Shalit and Johansson uh, suggest. And these are metrics uh, that measure the distance between probability distributions, right? So it's not a metric between two things, it's the difference between a probability distribution, and they're true metrics. They're not. Uh, they're not something like the KL divergence. They, they, uh, they're, they're true metrics. They obey the triangle inequality. And uh, these things, uh, integral probability metrics, are popular in machine learning for things uh, like measuring the distance between images. Uh, so uh, here's an example of a type of model I'll talk about later called a generative adversarial network. This is the type of model that generates deep fakes or pictures of fake people. And one way, is that the model, one way that the model learns is by trying to get better at minimizing, uh, minimizing the distance between generated pictures and, and real pictures. Um, so there's a couple of these, uh, maximum mean discrepancy. This is one that's based on the kernel trick. Uh, if you project, I'm not even gonna worry about these things, actually, I think I'm just gonna keep going. But maximum discrepancy is one. If you're interested in another one, the other one is called Wasserstein or Wasser. I don't actually know how to pronounce German, uh, but Wasserstein, Gans or whatever. Uh, that's a model you can look up. That's uh, very popular in machine learning. Whoops, I meant to skip this one. Okay, so you can apply this IPM loss. So you can tell the network. Not only do you have to be good at predicting the potential outcomes, but every time you predict the potential outcomes you have to try and force the two distributions close together in representation space. And so uh, there's they provide good motiva motivation for this uh, to provide strong bounds on kind of the prediction. It's not necessarily the same as uh, you know, consistency and bias that social scientists care about, but they do provide bounds on the generalization error if you were trying to predict out of sample using, using this loss. Uh, and it has pretty good uh, empirical formance, performance. And uh, in later papers, they do combine it with propensity score weighting to get uh, consistency guarantees, which I think are kind of cool. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go somewhat quickly through this as well, uh, because I just don't wanna get super bogged down uh, in details. Uh, but uh, another thing you could do, right, is you could, instead of taking a loss there, you could predict the propensity score. and uh, instead of feeding a, a gradient back to uh, to the representation functions, you just say, here's one single extra neuron. Can you just use that to model probability of treatment? And uh, that neuron learns to model the probability of treatment. 
and then you use it for inverse propensity score weighting just like you would in any other type of context where you want to do causal estimation like this, right? So here the network does have two losses. Again, it's trying to minimize error on predicting the potential outcomes and it's doing the binary cross entropy or the log loss or whatever to get good at predicting the probability of treatment. Uh, and you know, in machine learning, when there's multiple objectives like this, it's common to use an, a hyperparameter like alpha or lambda or whatever uh, that the user can choose to decide which one they think is more important. And now this can be a doubly robust estimator because we have both outcome and treatment modeling here. And so this network I think is great. Uh, the code that I'm gonna show you is adapted from this, this wonderful paper by Claudia Schur and David Bly, I think. David Bly, David Bly, uh, and Victor Reich. Um, uh, but uh, there's kind of extensions to this using uh, targeted maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the details of this here, but the basic idea is that uh, if you want to estimate treatment effects, you have to maximize the likelihood. The likelihood has a lot of nuisance parameters that you don't actually care about. What you're really interested in is the average treatment effect and these things about outcomes and treatments, like those aren't really important. So this is just a strategy to take that likelihood and kind of sharpen your focus on the parameters that you really are interested in by adding this extra nudge called the epsilon. Um, I'm not gonna go into more details about it, but uh, it, it's, a, it's interesting. This stuff came out of biostatistics and it is appealing because it's a great way to use machine learning estimators to get uh, est yeah, estimates with nice, nice uh, statistical properties while using any type of machine learning to get them. Um, and so this is just a nice adaptation you know, TMLE, target maximum likelihood estimation, has all of these consecutive steps where you have to run this model and this, this model and this model. This is an adaptation, so you can do it all in one pass in a neural network uh, each time you train it. So I think uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and again, with TMLE, the goal, the, the guarantees are around the, the total average treatment effect, not the conditional average treatment effect. Uh, but this, this thing does seem to perform quite well for heterogeneous treatment effects as well. And sorry, if that wasn't clear, heterogeneous treatment effects and conditional average treatment effects, those are, those are the same thing. Okay, so the last thing I wanna do is a generative example. So I hinted at these, these types of models before. These are called generative adversarial networks. And they're one of several popular kind of generative models that are used in the machine learning literature right now. Uh, if you wanna learn more, you can read the review paper. Not only do I talk about these architectures, but I also talk I also talk about um, general models used in deep learning. So I think it's a good introduction to the field uh, as, as a social scientist, that's the idea at least. But uh, the goal here is that we wanna learn a latent variant model that can generate the data. And uh, for really complex data, it's very hard to define a likelihood that is realistic for how data is generated. And so it's hard to tell whether you've even done a good job uh, to give give a supervised learning model that needs examples of, did I do it right or did I do it wrong? It's hard to, it's hard to give it a way of, of knowing that or, or making that information useful. And so the trick here is something that's kind of both hacky and ingenious, which is you just have another neural network produce the loss function. You don't have to understand what the likelihood is, but another neural network is gonna make that up. And you do this by having two networks, one called a generator and, and one called a discriminator. And so, the, the networks are playing what is called a, a minimax game, like a, a cops and robbers game. And so the, the generator is gonna take a noise and it's gonna generate a, a deep fake or whatever. Uh, and then the discriminator says, I see your deep fake. And I also know about this in, you know, distribution of real pictures. Do I think that this picture that you gave me is from the real distribution or the fake distribution? Is it generated or is it real? And uh, if the discriminator says, uh, I think that the fake picture is real, the generator says, oh, I must be doing a good job. I'm gonna keep going along this path. But if the discriminator can tell the difference, uh, then, uh, then, then the generator says, well, this, this is a dead end. Maybe I should go in a different direction. And they're both learning in real time. So they're, they're alternating with each other or, or training at the same time. And so if you do this for hundreds of thousands of 
of for millions of, of iterations, you end up with these really convincing, you know, pictures. So in this case, we actually want to use it to not generate pictures, but counterfactuals. Uh, so uh, this is just kind of an example. I don't have an implementation of this model. Maybe I should, but uh, I just wanted to show it to you. But this, this model has two actual GANs, uh, but let's just focus on the first one. The first one is going to take in treatment information, X and noise, and it's going to generate a counterfactual, right? And then the discriminator is going to take a factual outcome and X and a counterfactual outcome. And it's going to say, uh, which one of these outcomes is from the factual distribution? And the idea is that by playing this minimax game, the generator is going to get uh, better at, at generating counterfactuals. So then in this model, they have another network, uh, which they say, after we've run the, the, the first network uh, to completion, we now have a model, a generator, that can generate a complete data set. So they, they take a complete data set where now they have Xs, they have a factual outcome and a counterfactual outcome. Obviously, it's Y0 or Y1, depending on the unit. Uh, and now we're going to run another GAN uh, where uh, the goal is to generate you know, treatment effects. So it generates treatment effect distributions. Um, and they say one motivation for that is, is to kind of get a null, a generative model of the null distribution of treatment effects. The first model is really, I think, the kind of theoretically interesting point that I'd want you to focus on. So uh, this is quite an extensive literature. That's not actually true. Maybe there's 30, 30 papers or something, but there, there are a lot of different approaches that people are trying. Um, and I only kind of got to talk about a few here, but uh, here's some more if, if you're interested or you can reach out to me about the paper. Um, what I think is interesting though, or what is exciting for these things that we just really won't be able to do with other types of, excuse me, of machine learning uh, is uh, to, to work with confounding and latent confounders encoded in different types of data. Maybe there will be some stuff able to do this with text, but I think in general, it's pretty exciting to think about like, is there something in an image uh, that, that we would want to uh, control for? So for example, this is just something I, I, I'm, I was thinking made up now, but, but maybe you have a bunch of pictures of politicians and you want to know the causal effect of, of having a red tie on tweet response by some group or whatever. And you want to isolate everything else in the picture that could be, you know, confounding within the picture about the politician, about their background, or whatever, except for the causal effect of wearing a red tie. That's maybe a type of example where I think you could do it with images, or it might be interesting to do it with images. Um, obviously, there's a lot of covariates outside of the picture that could be confounding, but no, no one's really worked with images very much yet. Uh, Obviously, people are interested in text. Uh, there's actually a large literature about causal inference in text. Uh, people at Princeton actually are very interested in this. Uh, and so there's some work on this with, with deep representations of text as well. Uh, and then something I'm also very, very interested in is, is graphs. So uh, it's very difficult to actually do uh, causal inference on treatment effects that might be contagious within graph structure. but the idea here is actually that maybe you have uh, you have confounders that you haven't measured, like gender, that might actually be inferable from the graph structure, right? Even if you haven't measured them themselves. So th there are some papers working on these types of questions, right? So um, you know, I'll give you an example of of the graph paper and the text paper. So in the graph paper, you know, the example he gives is you want to know, you have a bunch of bloggers and they want to know whether they generate more uh, page views if people are reading on mobile or uh, people are reading on mobile or, or desktop. Uh, and uh, the confounding is that uh, that bloggers that have kind of the same genre or whatever are likely to have similar kind of outcomes. And so we can use the, the peer networks between the bloggers, not between the readers, 
as a way to get at those kind of latent topics or writing styles. Uh, for text data, like an obvious one is sentiment of reviews, right? Like the text encodes a lot of information about the product. We might not even know, you know, everything that, that you know, that, that there might be lots of things in the text that we're interested in, but maybe we're just interested in sentiment and we're interested in the outcome on sales. Uh, there's a lot of exciting extensions of this too for things like continuous treatments using GANs to generate continuous treatment uh, generators or uh, when you have treatments that vary over time uh, and themselves either become confounders because you want the treatment affected each time or have time varying confounders. So there, there are a lot of interesting extensions for this literature. Um, so strengths and weaknesses, like I think this stuff is very exciting. I think in terms of bias, this is state of the art for heterogeneous treatment effects. There are some models like the CFR net thing that I showed you and the dragon net algorithm I showed you, and those are implemented in my tutorials that do have some nice kind of statistical guarantees that, that, that are important to social scientists. Uh, and I do think that this really is, is the next most obvious way to do kind of causal inference from, from representations of complex data uh, that, that we can move forward in extending causal inference to new settings, right? Uh, I think there are significant weaknesses to, to this approach that uh, are going to have to be hammered out, uh, and um, yeah, and, and that are caveats at this point. Uh, so the most obvious one that nobody talks about is that neural networks are very difficult to train, right? And maybe for a linear model or even a decision tree model, you train it and you optimize it, and you're done. Uh, the the functions learned by neural networks are non-convex, and so you're not going to get the same answer every time. And so in simulated data, you can figure out whether it's working or not. But uh, I think it is tricky uh, to, to say that this definitely, I got the, the answer, the correct answer this time. And, you know, this is across machine learning. This isn't like, oh, this is a, you know, problem I should give up. You know, any type of machine learning model, you have to tweak it and tune it and figure out, uh, you know, is it working? Is it doing what, what I want? And, and that does not impede people from using them, but I do think it's a caveat that I should share with you. Um, there aren't any examples that I'm aware of that have really used these models empirically yet. Uh, uh, Reaggregating heterogeneity, I think, is an interesting topic uh, in machine learning for causal inference. You're you develop these very individualized conditional average treatment effects, and then you want to reaggregate them into something meaningful. Um, and then I think the theory is still catching up in some of these cases. So in, in some ways, I think the theory has caught up for things like generalization bounds. Uh, but there are other areas, like if you really are interested in inference and not prediction, uh, there are some models that work well uh, that, that have that and some models that don't. And I do think we're going to need more theory uh, to, to better understand uh, how to do causal inference from, from complex data representations where we have reasonable identification assumptions that, that, we, can, that we can meet. OK, so uh, there are tutorials. Uh, this is my GitHub. You can find them there. But I also emailed you a tutorial. And maybe Megan can post the link in the chat if you uh, don't want to look it up. And we'll transition to that. Uh, but that's it for me. Um, so uh, yeah, I think. That's kind of the formal presentation part. If if anybody has questions, uh, now now is probably a good time. No questions. Okay. All right, I'll give you like 10 more seconds. Really, please don't be shy. I feel like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ground covered. So even if it's something very basic about neural networks or causal inference, uh, totally fine to, to bring it up. I have a question, Bernie. Mm -hmm. So when I hear about uh, neural networks, I often hear about enormous data sets. 
-hmm. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the use of these models for causal inference in social science, like what kinds of data set sizes are needed? Yeah, I think that's a, I don't know about a fallacy, but so there's a question chat about that, but like you need enormous data sets if you have enormous models, right? Uh, you, you don't have to have enormous models. And actually the simulations, which uh, I'm going to show you with that people use in this literature are arguably the data set is too small. They, they use data sets that are larger, but this, this experiment has like 700 to 800 observations. Um, so it's actually quite a small data set. And if you have these models with just a few uh, layers, uh, I think it's actually uh, reasonable to, to train these models on, on data sets, probably not much smaller than a thousand examples. And obviously it depends on your treated and controlled distributions more than the size of the data set. Um, yeah, and, and the richness of your covariates. But, but yeah, I think it's not impossible to, to you don't need a hundred thousand, you know, examples to do this. So, yeah. I ask a follow-up question then. If the architectures mm -hmm. are much simpler, uh, do they have the same good performance that you see in the more complicated architectures? Yeah, I think um, when I say they're simpler, you can simplify them by the number of nodes in each hidden layer and the number of layers, right? Uh, so. Uh, in that sense, like that can make a huge difference in the number of parameters you you have in the model that you're you're trying to train. Um, so, uh, in terms of like, I guess like that's that's kind of a, a question because like the architecture, like you could have a multi-layer perception on that you know just a single network that has tons of layers and is huge, uh, and maybe that's better. Maybe if you over parameterize your model, uh, it's going to do a great job with in sample performance. And it might even do a great job with out of sample performance. Like this is a complete tangent, but in natural language processing, they now use these enormous models that have trillions of parameters. And uh, they do these impressive question answering and machine learning, machine translation things. And there's question whether these, these, these models have actually just memorized the internet. So I think, uh, I guess where I'm going with this is it doesn't so much depend on the size of the data or the size of, of the, the model. I think it really has to do with the design of the model. And you could probably scale these architectures up and down uh, to, uh, you know, the, to, to appropriate for, for your data and, and your, your, challenge, your problem. Yeah. I don't mean to hog all the questions, so everyone else should feel free. And if Bernie, if this is beyond the scope and you want to get to the tutorial, That's fine. Please, uh, yeah, I, I did. You so mentioned fine. the architecture, and I did mm -hmm. wonder. My I don't know much about deep learning, but my understanding is that the architecture in a lot of those models is custom to the task. They have one mm -hmm. specifically for images, or specifically for text sure. um, or audio. Um, what kind of architecture? would you use for a social science problem, like the example that you? Yeah, that's a that's sure. a great question, actually, Matt. So yeah, so um, basically when we talk about these different architectures for different types of data, kind of the still, the mean potatoes is still this multi-layer perception thing, uh, or what, what are called, you know, feed forward layers, right? Like, uh, let's see. You know, something something that looks like this, like this is the meat and potatoes of, of all neural networks are layers that look like this. And this is taking, you know, continuously valued vectors, so numbers, and transforming them into other numbers. And so that's that type of tabular data is what a lot of, uh, yeah, it, that's, that's what a lot of social science data looks like. So even when we have these different types of, uh, you know, sophisticated types of architectures, for different types of data, uh, it's very common to have what's called like end-to-end -end learning uh, or or uh, transfer learning. We have this super co complicated architecture. It does all this fancy stuff. It takes the image in, and at the end, uh, it gets out a vector of numbers, a representation of numbers, and then you just go back and feed it to the the feed-forward network, the multi-layer perceptron-style networks. Uh, so so. 
you know, that that kind of question in some ways, like that's kind of the appeal of, of deep learning and, and neural networks is that those things are actually quite generalizable and not that specific, right? Like once you've solved the problem of what's the best way to, to you know, regularize this complex data I have to get it into a vector space, a representation, then you can plug that representation theoretically anywhere. Again, I think the hard part is actually not the estimation, but the identification assumptions for using these representations. But um, does that kind of answer the question, Matt, or, or not really? Yep, thank you. OK. Bernie, we have another question in the chat. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's a great question. Like, what is an appropriate level of model complexity? So I do think, like, in, in that sense, those types of questions, uh, there are already people thinking about those questions uh, in like, for example, the TMLE literature I mentioned. Uh, and in that case, in some ways you can think about what we're doing and maybe I didn't make it clear is we're, we're making plug-in estimators, right? So these things are just estimating some quantity, right? Like the Y1 or the Y0 potential outcome. Uh, and uh, then we're plugging it in to, to compute the treatment effects or treatment effect distributions that we're interested in. So in that sense, like maybe the model complexity is, is not so much, uh, it's not so important. And uh, I mean, obviously that depends on how you're using these things, but that's kind of the trick that people have been using for machine learning for causal inference in general. It's like we take the orbital laser machine learning model and we use it to get this one quantity, you know, the propensity score or the outcome model or whatever, and then we'll plug it into a more principled approach uh, to, to kind of actually estimate our treatment effects. Um, and then kind of the other uh, answer to Nicholas's question is like, then it, it, it is a machine learning problem and there are ways for doing this for machine learning, right? This is, we train our model, we look at the validation error and we figure out when to stop it. And we look at validation performance and we figure out the model, we try different model complexities uh, until we find one that seems to have good uh, out of sample validation performance. Yeah, I think, you know, that 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 might be an, uh, I don't know, I don't know about unsatisfying, but unnerving answer to, or unprincipled answer seems to a social scientist. And I think that would be a fair critique, right? I think social scientists are interested, uh, or at least comfortable with tools that work the same way every time. Uh, and there's appeal to having things that don't, require a lot of particularized design decisions. But people do this stuff in, you know, all over the world outside of social scientists, outside of social science. So I, I don't feel like that should necessarily be a, a reason to be like, you know, let's, this is a dead end or whatever. Um, cool. Should we, since we have like 30 minutes, should we turn to, uh, should we turn to the the, the tutorial and, and see if we can show you some code? Oh, there's another question. I have some basic questions. To what extent using neural network generate generate counterfactual? Uh, okay. Um, that's uh, really interesting. So the counterfactual text thing is something that's really interesting. I think that's a whole nother topic, but that's literally the biggest question right now. And in, in is like, you know, sexiness of natural language processing, like is the text generated by these, these big models that I was mentioning, is it realistic? So uh, I don't know how to answer uh, that question. So I'm gonna table that one uh, first. Uh, Um, yeah, I think like to the extent that these things do significantly improve performance, I, I do really believe that the bias on these things is better and it's always going to be better than any other type of estimator, uh, you, you can come up with in maybe including non-parametric matching, which has its own challenges. Um, 
So again, like I think, you know, Nicholas and Matt, they raise other questions. Like there's a lot of questions about how do you do this? But uh, if there is a payoff at the end, it's that this is gonna be a lower bias answer. Um, and if you wanna look at the tutorials, I, I, I kind of go through later tutorials about how you might do hyperparameter selection in a way that's principled for causal inference by trying to uh, maximize these PE scores. Uh, JC, I think that's how you pronounce your name, says, I think it gets a C grade when prompted to write a high school essay. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it looks good for two sciences and then they start talking about penguins or whatever. Uh, okay. Um, Yeah, I don't know if I answered, let's see. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I really do think uh, in terms of something like matching, then you only have matched samples. So uh, you don't really have a function uh, where it's super easy to do condi conditional average treatment effects, I would, I would think. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would I, yeah, I think there are challenges to matching. Um, but we can discuss that later if uh, you know we're interested. Um, I actually do want to transition to the tutorials before uh, we run out of time. Um, so let's go there. Uh, thank you, Megan, for posting the link. And I'm going to open it up and screen share again. Sorry, I don't know if that was the greatest answer to the last question, but uh, I'm happy to chat later about it. Um, okay, so this is, uh, if you're not familiar with this environment, uh, everybody can see this, right? I think, yeah. Um, if, if you're not familiar with this environment, like this is a Google Collaboratory, that's a free thing built into your Google Drive for you to try out machine learning. Uh, there's support for Python primarily, but also I believe R and Julia and other languages you might want to try. Uh, the great thing about it is that they're giving you a virtual computer with all of the packages that you could ever want pre-installed. And additionally, if you want, uh, you can change the runtime and use a GPU. So I would think most social scientists, like I currently don't have a graphics card, and this can really accelerate uh, training of neural networks uh, if you want to go that route. The models we have here are so small that it's not necessary and might actually be slower to load the data on and off the GPU. But uh, it's a really great, this is a really great place if you wanna learn about machine learning, it's a great platform. So what we're gonna do here is introduce you to three kind of uh, simple, um, I'm gonna introduce you to, to three kind of simple deep learning models for causal uh, estimation, starting from the most naive to slightly more naive to Tarnet, which is arguably not that much less naive, but it's kind of the, the bread and butter of, of this approach uh, in this literature so far. Uh, sure, I shouldn't say naive, simple, yeah. Um, and so if you wanna check out the rest of the tutorials or email me about the review, I'm happy to provide it. The rest of the tutorials deal with more complicated questions like uh, how do you do these things like selecting the complexity of the model uh, for a causal inference setting when you don't actually care as much about, uh, you know, just getting good outcome regression performance. Uh, and so I think those are open questions in this literature, but I tried to show how you might deal with them with, with where, where the literature is now. Um, so I think this stuff here, these first couple of blocks, we basically discussed, but I thought it'd be helpful for people who didn't get a chance to look at the talk. Um, here's some notation. Um, yeah, so the only things that you maybe haven't seen are I'm going to note loss functions. I'm going to have the true value here and the predicted value here, right? This is just a fancy switching way to say the K in case you have the treatment is zero or one, you can use the switch here. That's, that's just a trick. Okay, so the data I already told you a little bit about, uh, it's actually from the DAG that I showed you earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is from, this is provided by Frederick Johansson on his website. Uh, it's commonly used, this simulation throughout. Uh, oh, great. Yes, I was, 
running through this. I love it. Love the, the feedback. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this this block here just loads the data, um, and uh, you can read more about how the data is simulated here if you're interested. But basically, this data set has true counterfactuals. You get an observed factual and a true counterfactual because she took the experiment, deleted the outcomes, and simulated them. OK, um, so I'm just going to run this. It's going to take a little bit time for my runtime to start up. And I created a data dictionary. And so this is what the data looks like. Right? You have 25 dimensional, this is for five units. 25 dimensional vectors for their covariates, their x's. You have zeros or ones for their treatment. You have an outcome. Uh, and then you have these noiseless potential outcomes that weren't drawn from a normal distribution or whatever. And then to, this is just a track to improve training. I've, I've rescaled the outcomes between like negative one and one. I, I can't remember, maybe just normally rescaled. I can't remember. Um, okay. so. Let's do the stupidest thing we can, which is train a, uh, a, a multi-layer perceptron to predict both potential outcomes just by feeding it the x and the t. And uh, then we'll just, you know, we get y hats and we'll just subtract them to get case. So in poor TensorFlow, uh, someone mentioned that NumPy is kind of the numerical computing thing in Python. There, <clears throat> <clears throat> There's not really an equivalent in R, but don't worry about that. And we don't actually need this for this, so we'll skip it. Uh, and then this is the simplest API to do, right, you know, neural networks and TensorFlow. Uh, it's really easy. There's kind, of, uh, there's kind of three, you know, you just say, I want a sequential model, and then you list the layers. Uh, you give an activation function, so it could be the sigmoid function you mentioned. This is uh, exponential, linear, unit, or something. You say how much regularization you want on it, and that's it. So we have a deep learning model that takes inputs here. It has one layer with 100 units, another with 100. Then it has an output layer, which obviously has no activation function because we're doing regression. And we're done. We've written the model. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's both cool and kind of uh, crazy that you don't have to understand anything and, and you can write a deep learning model today. So here I've just concatenated the data and the treatment information. Um, and we can run this, it's gonna create our model. Uh, we can use a pre-built-in, you know, <clears throat> TensorFlow gives you a bunch of, of popular loss functions that you can use, I think, if we wanted to, at risk of totally screwing this up, we could see what the other losses are. Okay, I'm not going to deal with it, but you you should be able to see a bunch of other losses that are available to you. Um, so we'll just use the mean squared error here. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here that I was not going to teach you right away, so that we kept this simple. But you can just run this block. Ooh. Let's see. Um, let me see if I can fix that. Um, now's a good time to ask questions while I solve this, which should hopefully be uh, just a minute. Sorry, I, I, I tried these things, but sometimes you run the cells out of order and yeah. Hopefully this will work. Mm -hmm. And I will hide this again to make things uh, pretty. Okay. All right. So assuming you didn't see any of that, the two, the only two things you have to do uh, you're missing a definition of SGGLR. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Thank you again. We'll put those things back here. I'll just put them. Uh, I'll just put them. I would put them in the in the other thing, but I'll put them. Uh, you can just put them at the the top here. So, and basically, this is all you need to do to train a neural network. You don't need to understand anything about the training procedure. Uh, you don't even need to specify half of these arguments here. Uh, you know, epochs is the number of epochs you want to run. Uh, batch size is how many units you want to have in a sample. Validation split is how much you want to set aside for validation and how much you want to set aside for, uh, uh, for training. Um, so, and that's it. I'm actually going to, I had one more slide I want to show you uh, to kind of do more of a introduction to practical deep learning. Um, because if you are familiar with machine learning, there's still some differences uh, compared. So real quickly, practical considerations for training networks. There's two frameworks, one from Google and one from uh, Facebook. The one from Google is called TensorFlow. Uh, the one from Facebook is called PyTorch. They're increasingly very similar. Uh, there was one huge difference between the two that is no longer a big thing. PyTorch is more largely used in the academic community but I would assume the TensorFlow user base is much larger. You, you can get started with either. I don't have any recommendations either way. Um, so the way that neural networks are trained is they have this loss and then whatever that error was is back propagated to the weights in the network proportionally. So it just kind of trickles back uh, in the network. And so this is very different. I mentioned than other types of machine learning is the, the functions learned here are non-complex you probably are over-parameterized, right? And so you're unlikely to reach a global optima. So regularization is really important in machine learning, uh, in, in deep learning, right? In machine learning, we use regularization to kind of provide safeguards for us for overfitting our training data that won't, uh, won't generalize to new data. And the most kind of fundamental thing in, in deep learning is in deep learning, we, again, don't run to completion. We just do passes through our data. <clears throat> so uh, we feed, the, the network little bits of data at a time called a batch. So if there's 600 training examples, we might feed it 64 units at a time. And that's so the gradients don't get too big or too small. They're kind of manageable bite-sized chunks, like slow and steady wins the race. And every time we show the network a complete set of all the batches, that's called an epoch uh, or an epic. Sorry, I don't actually know how it's pronounced. Maybe it's epic. Uh, and so each cycle of training that it sees all the batches is called an epic. And you're gonna run the network, train the network for a number of epics uh, until you've decided that training is good enough. No one is gonna be like, training's done, you're done. And the way that you know training is good enough is, you know, obviously in our training data set, the arrow is gonna go over down over time, but eventually it's gonna plateau and we're not gonna get much better. But in the validation set, the error is always gonna be higher because it wasn't trained on that data. It's gonna go out down over time but eventually, if you keep training, you're going to overfit your training data set, and you're going to start to perform worse on your validation set. So you want to stop a number of epochs, epics, or epochs when when your your validation performance has has stopped decreasing and is flat before it starts increasing again. And then there are other types of regularization that are, you know, norms like L2 and L1 norms are popular for linear models. Uh, dropout and batch normalization, I'm not going to discuss because I do want to. I want to keep going. Okay, now I'll switch back to uh, this. Okay, so we trained a model here, and now we can just plug in our estimates to get uh, plug in uh, y1 and y0, predict from the model both uh, when we set treatment toggle treatment to zero and when it toggle treatment to one, and see what types of predictions we get. So here I'm just taking the X's uh, and uh, or I'm creating a, a, an array of zeros, an array of ones. I smush that onto the X, I smush the zeros onto the X, I smush the ones onto the X, and then I just tell it to predict it, okay? So now I have Y hat zero and Y hat one. And then to compute the Kate, I just subtract these, you know, element by element, Y one from Y zero. And to do the ATE, I can just average those. And so this is just kind of putting it all together. 
uh, hmm. this, uh, this thing did not seem to train this time. I wonder what happened. Um, I wonder if I didn't specify the, uh, Well, that's okay. Let's just keep going. Uh, so you can still see what, what you might have, have wanted to see. Uh, this thing didn't seem to converge. Uh, I think uh, maybe I didn't set the seed, so I got the same thing every time. Let's try again. Um, okay, so I, I'll have to play, play around with that. Hopefully the, the, the next ones will converge. But you can still see what we're getting here basically uh, is, um, let's see. So uh, blue is blue is the uh, uh, let's see, blue is the actual estimated cates. Uh, so there's there's something weird going on here where it's all predicting the same thing, and then uh, green is the true cates, and red is the error between them. Right, and so we're also calculating the score called the the PE score. So I'll fix this after the tutorial to make sure everything is running nice. Uh, it's running nice uh, last night, but I wonder what happened. Okay, uh, and so uh, basically the PE score is this difference between uh, the factual Kate, where you know both both the factual and the counterfactuals, and the uh, estimated Kate. Um, uh, and uh, in general, you don't know this quantity, but this is actually a pretty important theoretical quantity in this literature for generalization bounds. And in this case, we do know this quantity because we have simulated data. So you can note what that that p he is. You can square, you know, you square it and square root it so that it's always has the same cardinality. Uh, but I've calculated that here. Okay, so um, the next thing we want to do is this next most sophisticated model. And uh, you know, yeah, we're going to run out of time soon. But next most sophisticated model would be to have two multilayer perceptrons, one for y0 and y1. And this is called a T learner, right? Uh, and instead of doing this in sequential API, we're going to do it in the more sophisticated functional API. There's three APIs in, in TensorFlow. There's sequential, which is the simple one I showed you, uh, functional, and kind of an object-oriented API. And the functional one is for static computational graphs. And the imperative one is for uh, dynamic ones, which is how uh, PyTorch works. Um, there's reasons to use either or all of them. Uh, you can I, I put a link in here if you want to learn more about them. OK, so uh, now we're going to make uh, the t this t-learner model and using this functional API. And it's a bit more complicated, right? So we're going to import all of these different layers. We have an input layer dense layer, which you already saw, and then concatenate layer. And concatenate input is just something that specifies what the dimensions of your input are. Uh, it's, it's a little wonky. And then concatenate is just a convenience thing to smush things together. So we're going to write a function that will specify our model here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the inputs are x. Uh, and then we're going to have, uh, we're going to specify these two things concurrently. So it's idiomatic to write both the function that defines the object and actually the arguments for the object in one line in TensorFlow uh, because it makes very clear what's getting passed to what. So here we have input. It's going to produce some x. We're going to feed that x to the first y0 hidden layer and to the first y1 hidden layer. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have y0 and y1 uh, and y0 and y1. So basically, we have two layers for each of the heads, uh, and there are no shared layers. And then we're just going to smush together the, the outcomes so that we only have one output that's easier to deal with. So let's try this. OK, so that ran without errors. And let's see, the cool thing about the functional API is because it's a static graph, you can actually see what your model looks like. So we have this input layer. Uh, it says none because it doesn't know how many training examples it's going to get, but it does know that there's 25 rows. And this input is fed to, to two different pillars, right? Uh, we have, you know, a hidden, 
you know, basically two hidden layers and an output neuron, uh, output layer for for each for each head. Uh, and then they're going to uh, basically just this concatenate thing is again just a convenience thing. Okay, so I have a question for the chat now. If we just told this network maximize the mean squared error, what would happen? Would it work or would it not work? If we just said everybody, both heads, take in the same examples and maximize the mean squared error, what's going to happen? Both of you maximize the mean squared error, what's going to happen? Any ideas? Okay, so the answer is if they're both getting the same input data and they both have exactly the same loss function, they're going to end up getting the same gradients and learning the same things. And you're going to have two heads that are just identical networks. This head is going to learn the same thing as this head. So we need something here now to make sure that each head only gets gradients for Y0 if we want to be the Y0 head for untreated examples or, y, or treated examples if we want to be the Y1 head. And we could do this in a fancy way of balancing our data or whatever, or we could just write a loss function that does this. Uh, so we could make sure that every batch contains an equal number of treated and untreated examples, even though there's like an 80-20 split in our actual data and then pass it to the two networks. It's very complicated. Really what we just want to do is give it the error that's uh, relevant uh, to, to, to that head. So the way that we're going to do this is we've concatenated uh, Y and T. So the network passes both Y and T back. And basically, we're just going to make it so that um, we get losses for each head pr produces a Y0 pred and a Y1 pred. And we're just going to calculate the loss, the, the part of the loss that's relevant to that head. You know, And we'll do that for both 0 and 1. And we can pass back the sum of those losses to the network. And the TensorFlow will understand which, you know, where those gradients came from and which losses are appropriate. Does that make sense or is that confusing? So in this example here, right, if T true is zero, then you know you will get a one here and you get the whole you get the whole class. But if T1 here is is if T true here is one, then for those examples, you're going to multiply by zero, and it's not going to include those in calculating the loss for the for the for the y zero head. If that's uh, if someone wants me to explain it again, uh, thumbs up or something. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Okay. So now here's the, all the stuff that I abstracted for you, and hopefully uh, it's going to work better this time. Let's see. Uh, um, so we'll continue to use this built-in cares function. Like I said, you could write your own loop that goes through each epic uh, over and over. Uh, but And there's a lot of hyperparameter choices. I'm not going to focus on this. Uh, the main thing we need is, this, is an optimizer. That's going to optimize your network, you know, just just like you have an optimizer for a maximum likelihood model in R that you probably don't know about. There's an optimizer here, but this is a choice, you know. So there are popular ones. The one I'm showing here is just stochastic gradient descent, which is the classic one. Um, and I explained to you we're going to stop when we uh, <clears throat> we're going to stop when the validation loss starts getting worse again. So it'll improve and get, so that's what this early stopping thing is. And it'll do this automatically for us. And we're going to wait 40 epics after that validation loss stops improving before we actually stop. Um, and so there are other considerations here, which you can read. I also, in the spoiler here, there's more data about, you know, the things that I just explained to you on that slide. Um, so let's run this. I guess I haven't been running this these blocks, and uh, hopefully I won't be embarrassed and not have this do uh, produce something interesting. But let's see. Okay, so you can see the validation loss. Uh, so regression loss is the actual uh, loss. 
uh, validation loss includes regularization. So uh, these two things are, are actually comparable. And you can see that the, the validation loss is always going to be higher than the regression loss. We've done something wrong. All right, so let's see if this does something more interesting. OK, phew. I don't look like a complete idiot. OK, so this is really what I wanted to show you, right? And we're almost out of time, so I'll run quickly. But uh, here's the errors. Uh, here is the actual Kate estimates, which are blue. And here's the actual distribution, which is green. So you can see we're still off. Uh, obviously, it's better than the thing is totally wrong. But uh, the ATE predicted is about 3.6. And this PE score is, is an interesting metric, and that's 0.8. So the last thing I'll do, because we're out of time, is I already talked to you about representation learning, and we're going to do TARnet. And um, <clears throat> basically, uh, you know, I was going to have you do this here, but uh, you can write this in if you want. But I've also implemented TARnet here. And the, I'm cheating because we're out of time. But you just have to add these three layers. These are these representation layers here. This is the difference between Tarnet and the T-Learner, right, as they share representation layers. So let's run this. And let's train it with all the other settings being the same. This is what our model looks like now. We have these representation layers. Um, let's train it and see what happens. OK, so the validation loss stopped leveled off around uh, 195 epics, right? And so then continued for 40 more and then stopped. So let's see what this looks like. OK, so um, what's interesting here is the AT is a little bit better, but that's actually a pretty reductive quantity. And that's not really what we're interested in or why you would even use these models, right? We got 3.58. But the, the PEHE score, which is really capturing the difference between these two distributions, uh, is much better. And you can even see this kind of weird blip that, that happens with the real data is captured uh, here in the estimates a little bit better than when you didn't have those shared representation layers. OK, so um, I'm out of time, uh, but I've linked to the other tutorials here. Uh, I will try and clean this up for future viewers who uh, uh, want this to work uh, without the hiccups. Uh, and I just want to thank you all so much for attending. I, I enjoy six. I love teaching six. I, I like sharing this stuff. I hope this is interesting for you. And I hope maybe this will get you interested in deep learning using causal inference and writing some cool empirical papers. And if not, at least maybe it'll get you interested in, in deep learning. So thank you very much. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bernie. Um, so I'll give Bernie a round of applause for this tutorial. Uh, so at this point, we're going to stop the recording.